Welcome back to Cinema Flicks and Music Picks. I'm Davy, your host with the most, the beast with the least. Least I can do today is yawn. Because I was up at the crack of dawn this morning. As the postman knocked, I thought, oh, good, I've got a couple of cool things coming today. What have you got for me, Mr. Postman? And he brought, as you'll have seen from the thumbnail, the new box set of in the Courts of the Crimson King, the documentary celebrating 50 years of King Crimson. We know it's now more than 50 years, but when this came out, it was indeed 50 years. Um, I brought a few other things too, but they don't really tie in. I can't find a way to tie in Star Trek Discovery Season 4 or M.R. James Ghost Stories particularly to, uh, to this. But regardless, um, usual format for when it's a music uh, when it's a new music thing and a review at the same time I'll show you the product first of all for those of you who just want to see what it is uh, just want to see what you're maybe buying um, and then I'll kind of go into the more review part so it comes in box like so it's a DGM logo on the spine and this would be reasonably familiar to anybody who gets the various crimson sets that you get kind of digipack inlays. So if we open it up, you'll just fold it like so. It's empty, empty case then, you seen that? It's exciting, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And then one by one. So they all come in these digipack sleeves. Um, so but best best to them in order, that's probably the best way. So if we start with numero uno with Mr. Fripp himself on the front. So this is the film on Blu-ray. Okay. And you get, as with all the Crimson releases, even the box sets, very similar format. It gives you the contents on the inside with this one's dying to jump out. So you get in the court of the Crimson King. Crimson King at 50, the documentary, um, 5.1 DTS HD MA LPCM stereo, uh, filmed by Tommy Amis. Um, excerpts from Cosmic F KC Cosmic, which was a kind of first draft of the movie um, that was. Uh, a 23 minute edit from the early version of the film, there you go. Well, my version was more concise than that. Starless, the final performance, uh, live at Bunkimura in Tokyo, December the 8th, 2021. So it takes us right up until just about a year ago, even though the film's two years old. Um, two years in terms of the tour itself? Three years? Goodness, time. Doesn't time fly when there's a worldwide pandemic? Uh, trailers and additional short films, uh, Schizophonia, Widows, Rain Dance, an official trailer. And then Blu ray 2 is Kim King Crimson Tring live in the studio, Radical Action Suite, The Letters, Sailor's Tale, Cadence and Cascade, Fracture, Starless, and Discipline. Um, and you get an audio option only on the Blu-ray as well. You can watch it, the performances, or you can just have an audio only option. Um, Rock and Reel, um, which has Drumzilla, Neurotica, Red, uh, Court of the Crimson King, Indiscipline, Epitaph, and 21st Century Schizoid Man. Again, 5.1 DTS HD. Um, and that's an LPC 5.1 or 24 and um, over 96. Um, so that's from the Rockland Real Festival. And then Gentlemen of the Roads, a 36 minute short film backstage with King Crimson. And this is the 2018 lineup. I won't show you all the discs because they're all the same format. They all come in these black sleeves and all have very similar. Layouts are just like that. So, and that's the disc there. So, film and a bonus disc, which I believe, should you just buy the standard edition of the movie, 
this is what you get the film with the bonus disc and um, with no extra musical content so I believe essentially this is what you get if you just buy the film however this is not just the film it comes with quite a few other things um, so first of all you get the exact same but with DVD this time so you know if you've maybe got another player or you went to loan it to somebody who doesn't have HD um, exactly the same product no need to go through the content um, but then four discs here which are CDs let's go through the contents of these so on this oven um, it's essentially um, music from the film soundtrack and beyond um, is what it's called um, so we get um, from as early as 2018 um, we get um, introductory bellscape live um, from the 6th of November 2018 um, and then we get the um, Schizoid Man edit from the 2019 uh, 69 sessions box set basically the Court of the Crimson King Stephen Wilson remix box set um, Moonchild with cadenzas from Philly in 19 um, Cat Food recorded at Wessex Studios 1970 alternate mix Lizard um, with Prince Rupert Awakes and Bolero and that's from the King Crimson 50th set and Live in Rome respectively um, which is 2018 uh, The Letters 2018 from um, uh, just the studio in Tiring. Um, Tiring also offers um, Sailor's Tale. Then we get Easy Money from Auckland, Lark's Tongues Part 2, um, which is from the complete recordings of Lark's Tongues box set, um, which was again remixed by Stephen Wilson. Um, so essentially, it takes a lot of modern live performances and juxtaposes them with the contemporary band they're also talking about at the time that they're covering that part of the King Crimson history throughout the documentary. We'll go into that. Um, Fracture, uh, Tring 2018. Um, Fallen Angel from the uh, Road to Red box set, uh, recorded at um, Olympic Studios in '74. Um, live in the studio Tring version of Discipline Cadence and Cascade again Tring um, live in uh, Dimijgen sorry I'm pretty sure that's in Holland um, is the construction of light and that's from uh, summer 2019 Peace live, live in Vienna uh, 2016 uh, Mati uh, Kustai um, it's recorded at Island Studios in 1981 and that's from the KC50 series 6 CD set which isn't out yet. Hmm. Oh, there's always more, always more. The Mensa recorded at Air Studios, or completed at Air Studios, uh, live in Zurich 73 from the Starless and uh, Babel Black uh, recording. Um, a scarcity of miracles from the Radical Action CD, which was live in Japan 2015. Um, Radical Action Suite 2018. Um, Tring again. So again, a lot of this stuff's in the studio. It's the current band, then contemporary band, um, recording classic songs essentially as the soundtrack of the film. Um, Peace, a theme from the forthcoming complete. In the wake of Poseidon recording sessions, recorded at Wessex Studio 1970, mixed by Stephen Wilson 2022. So again, we're getting advanced stuff here as well, which is really quite cool. And on to this one. CD3, Drumzilla. I've done them in slightly the wrong order. I did CD5 and 6 now. No, wait, I did CD1 and 2. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, so I'm forgetting that. Although we've done discs, they weren't CDs. Uh, Drumzilla, live in Los Angeles, August 21. 
Waiting Man um, is from Off and On the Roads box set, Live in Frasius, 82. Um, Seizure is from the Roar of P4 and Heaven and Earth box set, um, 1998, San Francisco. The Talking Drum, uh, recorded at uh, Command Studios, 1973, which is in the uh, complete, complete Lark's Tongues and Aspect box set. Um, which again is a Stephen Wilson remix. Indiscipline, live Delray Beach 2021, so last summer, um, July. Exposure is from the Exposures box set, which uh, there's a video on this channel of, this here channel. Uh, Vroom, uh, live in Toronto 2015. Uh, Coda, Marine 475, 1996, from the collectible Crimson Volume 3. Darts from the Get Crafty cassette release by the League of Crafty Guitarists, um, which 2022 rem remaster um, at Possible Studios Berlin. That's interesting because we're still waiting on quite a bit of League of stuff, uh, League of Gentlemen, League of Crafty Guitarists. Um, Requiem from Beat. Um, which is recorded at Audio Studios, uh, Odyssey Studios, excuse me, and it's the extended Stephen Wilson version. Uh, disc 4, Walking Real, which is Real 19. Lark's Tongues Part 1, um, live in Stuttgart, uh, summer 2019. Um, Breathless from the Meltdown 3 CD. Uh, Blu-ray set from Poland 2018. One more Red Nightmare, um, which was from August 2021 in um, Sandy. Um, then you have Epitaph from Rio in October 2020. Um, frame by Frame, Nashville, September 2019. Pictures of a City, live in Osaka. Um, from December 2021, so it really is reasonably up to date. This, considering they had to make a whole documentary around it, and then um, Red Alive at St Augustine last July 2021, and then Rio de Janeiro again 2021 um, for Court of the Crimson King, and it closes with Starless. Uh, from Starless, the final concert, which is a forthcoming album again. So we've had a tease that there's at least three different uh, forthcoming albums that they've taken a little sample from. Um, and as always, I love that they do tell you down at the bottom if something's been previously released or it hasn't been released, and if it has been, where exactly you can find it. There's never any. Oh, I've already got that. You know, you you know, you know, they know. You know, they know, they know, you know. Yeah. So. Now, there's never any deception when it comes to that. And then, a rather nice book. Rather nice book. With uh, your Royal Albert Hall on the front now. Um, some notes from Toby Ames. Um, who used to be on your MTV, and I remember Toby Ames. So the film itself features John Armitage, Adrian Ballou, sister Dana Benedicta. The film interviews fans. Sister Dana is a nun who's a King Crimson obsessive. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. She's one of the highlights of this film. Um, Biff Blunged... I'm sorry Biff, I'm going to bleach your name. Blum Fungedjig... Sorry, Beth. Bill Bruford, Bill Collins, Robert Fripp, Michael Giles, Trey Gunn, Gavin Harrison, Jaco Yakovic, uh, Tony Levin, Jamie Muir, Ian McDonald, rest in peace, Bill Rifflin, rest in peace, Peter Simfield, P David Singleton, Jeremy Stacey, and Paul Stratford. Um, absent from the film but not forgotten, Boz Burrell, David Cross, David Enthoven, John Gaydon, Peter Giles, Barry Godberg, Gordon Haskell, Greg Lake, Andy McCulloch, Keith Tippett, Ian Wallace, and John Wetton. A couple of these guys, Ian McDonald died subsequently to the film being finished. 
um, but he is represented in here. He is in the film. Um, I'm glad this came early and I had the chance to watch it before making a video. Um, but one of the saddest parts of it is Bill Rethlin's in this a lot and he knows that he's dying of cancer. But he still records his parts, he doesn't leave the tour once, he stays on and stays a member of Crimson even though he knows that that's going to be the last thing he ever does. It's really, really harrowing, it's really hard to watch. And the most personal moments that you see Fripp really trying to come to terms with things or with with uh, with that, uh, with Bill. Um, Robert holds his cards very close to the chest for a lot of the time, but the moments where he is more loose and is more free about his feelings, it's certainly about Bill. Um, but yeah, there's some great shots from throughout as well. Um, and then you do, you know, there is a lot of it that's um, this. Twin Eleven, the man that, um, the man that was 60 when he was 40 and now that he's 70 he still looks 60. He's not aged. Um, so this goes through all the contents again. Um, but just get Gavin, Gavin there. Um, it's cool that it goes through all the, um, kind of notes about the making of and, and what not. Um, these are notes by David Singleton, the kind of manager of, of uh, Casey. Um, again, some great pictures of the the band as they were interviewed. I mean, there's Mr. Brufford down there, for example. Trey Gunn, not to be understated. Um, Pat Mastellato. Mr. Mel Collins, legend of various eras of Crimson. Um, I kind of uh, I read you this actually because it's it's a it's a kind of a mission statement from Fripp on the making of the film and what he thinks of it. Uh, Toby Ames has succeeded in making a grown-up film about working players of a certain age, living, dying, laughing, playing and rocking out. What Toby has not done is tell me what King Crimson is, but that I already know. Perhaps some of those who have been touched by King Crimson and its music already know too. Even so, it's unlikely they have had an introduction to the mechanics of the process, and here is one excellent introduction. That's Robert Fripp, The Mansion at Glen Cove, Long Island, 22nd of August, 2022. So as recently as that, Fripp was doing the liner notes just in August there, which, again, fascinating. That's Michael Giles, again, very early hero of the, the whole story with the Giles and Fripp stuff. There's Jacko. It's got such an interesting story with uh, Fripp, doesn't it? The way he kind of starts out in a tribute band almost with the um, with the um, 21st century schizoid band and then becomes a member himself. Um, there's E. McDonald and Adrian Ballou at the top. Adrian does get a bit short thrifted here. Um, he doesn't come out of it too well. It looks as if he's moaning quite a bit. But his moans are more than justified. He says that he was recorded for a lot longer and didn't actually moan all that much. Basically, they used the four minutes of moans, and that's all the screen time that he has. Um, there's Royal Albert Hall, London. Yeah, last shot. The film itself is fascinating um, because it's not your typical rock documentary. It is not. Um, the talking heads, uh, pardon the pun, because that could, that could mean it's not, um, stop making sense. It's not the uh, this happened, then this happened, then this happened, then this happened narrative. As Fripp alludes to there, he doesn't need to know what King Crimson is, and neither do you. If you don't know it by listening to the music, then you're never going to really know anyway. So what's more interesting from a, a KC fan point of view is to see the process. Um, perhaps more interesting to see the process of making new music 
Um, but in this you get to see the process of how a new lineup comes together and gels and improvises and the structures in which they come up with uh, wh how they can improvise so how far can you push it how far can you not push it and yeah it does deal with a lot of the fact that they have this malevolent dictator in charge sometimes and then the next day he's the most benevolent dictator they can possibly ask for as well um, he and Fripp doesn't apologize for it once but what he does say is that everything he does is in service of the music. Everything is for the sake of King Crimson. No decisions are personal, either to help someone or to criticise someone. All decisions are for the benefit of the sound that he has in his head to get King Crimson's sound out there. Um, so if that means firing a best friend, or if that means... Um, keeping on someone who he doesn't like then he'll do that because it's best for King Crimson at the time um, it also means that some people that thought they had careers for life after 20 years get phone calls sometimes don't even get a phone call and just that's it bye it's quite a revealing documentary as well in Fripp's relationship with the different members and how they all see him. So even the ones that are angry at the way they were treated ultimately at the end of their relationship with Robert, a lot of them still say, but I wouldn't change it. I wouldn't change it for anything. Because it was so powerful, so life-changing, and they had such a new way to think about music, life, and creation in general, and art in general and a process. Um, if you've seen Robert talking about um, the way he uh, believes you can create art, it's very similar to an almost mathematical um, problem solving point of view or the way an architect would design a building. Um, there's, there's almost something methodical to it like that. Um, where you can make small changes here and there but there needs to be a certain amount of structure at the inception and the the conception at the inception and then you can subvert it so once you know the rules you can break them essentially but you need to establish them in the first place um, so they're not a jam band but they can make versions of songs that are completely different to the versions that you know. So there are versions in here of, say, uh, Indiscipline, that are completely different to the studio versions. But there are versions in here of Epitaph that are very faithful. So some things are allowed to be played with a lot more. So some things are more canonical, um, some things are more sacred. Um, and some things are almost meant to be riffed on. They were always just starting points, never finishing points. Um, and Fripp makes that point in the documentary that the recordings that we hear on the studio albums are very much where the songs were birthed, but where they grow up is here, on the stage and on the road. Um, so it's a fascinating documentary into one of music's great artists in Robert Fripp and one of music's great bands in King Crimson and how they've been able to ooh, weather half century plus now of musical um, changes um, and truly progressing I mean there's a, you know the term prog rock I always find it a bit of a misnomer that um, you know Bless him, but I saw Steve Howe talking when Yes's last album came out, and he talked about the album The Quest, and he said, uh, "Oh, it's great. It sounds just like one we would have done in the seventies." And when he said that, and you see it with the admittedly lovely new Roger Dean painted cover, you just think, "Why is that progressive?" You're literally saying here's something we could have done fifty years ago with an album cover that's by the same guy who did those album covers fifty years ago. That is regressive rock, whereas Crimson are truly progressive. Never ever rest on the laurels. 
Um, you would never be able to just substitute tracks from reason to believe into Lizard. Um, you would never be able to look at the album cover for Thrack and just imagine that could be the album cover for The Wake of Poseidon. Truly progressive, and that's that comes from the top. That comes from Robert on down. And anybody who wants to be stuck in a mythical past and just play the hits, well, off you go and do that in some spin-off band or join Asia. Anyway, we've done twenty-five minutes on this box, but it's definitely worth it. Can I recommend this? Yes, in two, um, in two ways. The documentary I recommend for anybody who's a big music fan, obviously a Crimson fan, but even just a music fan, I'd recommend it um, because it's incredibly deep and incredibly powerful about creation and then about the humanity behind someone who's thought of as being quite a cold person. Now, we know from the videos he's made with Toya over the last year and two years now, that Robert's actually very down to earth and fun guy at home, but he takes his business, which is King Crimson, extremely seriously. Um, so for these little moments of humanity, like the way he deals with his friend's cancer, when when he deals with those kind of moments and talks about them, it's so powerful, so powerful. Um, and for that reason, it's it's an absolutely perfect music documentary. Just absolutely insanely perfect. Um, I can't recommend this enough. Do you need the extra um, six discs? Well, two of them are DVDs, so I don't think you need them unless you've got plans to give it to somebody else for a loan or something. The CDs, yes, you do need the CDs. They're a perfect soundtrack. Although a lot of them, um, a good chunk of the tracks have been released already, most of them haven't. Um, and most of them give you essentially a new Crimson Live album. That'll do. So yeah, um, and the great booklet. Um, so as a as a lovely document of the fiftieth anniversary of King Crimson, I'd say this is absolutely fantastic. And uh, yeah, can't really go wrong with this. So treat yourself at Christmas. Go on, get yourself this. Um, so many thanks to Burning Shed for sending this Lickety Split um, and yeah Burning Shed have got plenty of stock and that's the official store of uh, Fripp who you uh, DMG use so yeah head on to Burning Shed and get yourself a copy of this I'll put a link in the description below should I remember and if I don't remind me thanks very much for watching folks um, as always Stay very safe out there and love and mercy my dears. Love and mercy.